Welcome to episode 14 of Lizzie's Bedtime Stories. My storyteller is Patty Henderson, and this story needs a little bit of a warning. It doesn't have one of those cozy, happy endings. It's actually a little spooky. (laughs) Welcome back to the show, Patty. Oh, it's great to be back, especially uh, being able to come in and and tell a a little darker, more hard edge, uh, Brenda Strange uh, story. Um, It's a it's a short fiction which I decided to do as part of a um, Brenda Strange uh, point of view, as in uh, perhaps one of those straggling cases that she really had no closure to and no um, no set little idea of what actually would happen. So I call it the Brenda Strange Files and. Uh, she tells it in her own point of view, so it's a little bit different than, than the regular Brenda Strange novels. Ooh, I'm excited. You guys get up to the fire pit. It's time for a ghost-like story, you know, roast some s'mores, you know, marshmallows. It's going to be wonderful. Yes, this will be good. Sweet. It'll be nice to tell it. So tell us a story. Tell us a story, Patty. Okay, you want me? Are you ready to begin? I am ready for you to commence the merrymaking. Here we go. This was a very personal case for me and one of the most chilling because I knew the people involved. The memories of it still haunt me at times. Writing this, however, may perhaps help others in my field to prepare for such an experience. I hope that they never encounter what I faced in Millport, Maine. Tina and I had befriended Dana McCleary, a photographer attending some of the same classes with Tina at the Newark Art Institute. She was from Millport, Maine, but had been able to earn a two-year scholarship to the Institute and was sharing a cheap apartment near the Institute with her girlfriend while she completed her degree. Tina and I would have lunch at the Institute lunchroom every now and then, and we'd sit together and chat with Dana. Tina lost interest, but I continued the friendship with Dana, and up to the time Tina and I moved to Tampa, Florida, and Malfour House, Tina did tell me she'd heard that Dana and her girlfriend, Cheryl Garrett, had decided to leave Newark and move to Millport, where Dana had her parents' old home. I recall both Tina and I wondering the reason for Dana's abandoning her dreams of a big New York exhibit of her photography. She'd struggled to that end for years. She was, sadly a very poor photographer, seldom selling her natural scenes of mostly places around Millport, sailing ships, dirty ports, and quaint architecture. It was a chilly November day when I received a letter from Dana. I wondered if Tina had given her the address and wondered why, since I know they had drifted apart. The letter was addressed to me, and Dana offered her sympathies and condolences over Tina's death. I suppose the news had spread beyond the Institute and somehow reached Dana in Millport, Maine. Dana wanted to see me at her home. Her reasons were vague, only that it was a matter of much importance. She assured me that Cheryl would be okay with my visit. The letter was very upsetting. There was a certain sense of urgency that dominated every sentence. I'd never known Dana to be so irrational. What clinched it for me was her cryptic cryptic mention of paranormal activity. With Cubby firmly entrenched and quite comfortable in Malfour, and also quite willing to see the demands of Butterscotch, my cat, I decided to fly to Maine and check out what was happening in Millport, Maine. I took a JetBlue flight to Portland and then rented an SUV to drive up the Maine coast to Millport, which was barely a speck on the map I bought at the airport. Dana had actually sent a scribbled map and instructions on how to get to Millport from Portland, but it wasn't very legible, and I had to make numerous stops in mostly rural, out-of-the-way service stations as I made my way through the back roads of Maine. Dana's house was actually 10 miles north of Millport. After driving through the bouncy dirt roads of the village and breathing fish-tainted air, I couldn't reason why an ambitious artist like Dana would choose an out-of-the-way, backwards village like Millport for a home. The few people I spoke to were rude and resentful of visitors. They eyed me suspiciously. I felt like I was in Haven, a popular television show and sci-fi channel. I hit the deteriorated road, which led to her house, at about 4.30 p.m. 
The main wind had intensified, and the rows of tall, yawning trees lining the road on both sides of me seemed to sway and bend to an unnatural piping which played between them. Dana's home lay inland from Millport, at the foot of a small cluster of forests and cliffs beyond. The house was small, with very unusual eye-like windows. In the front yard of the great brick home rose a large, scarred oak tree, its twisted branches extending over the house itself, as if to swallow it whole. It all seemed so desolate and sinister. I left the SUV at the end of the narrow dirt driveway. The wind was so strong I had to pull up the collar of my coat. I knocked softly on the wooden door, hoping Dana's friendly face would answer and not the desperate woman who penned the letter. The woman who opened the door was a mocking image of Dana McCleary, the woman who Tina and I had known to be bright, passionate, and attractive had transformed into a pale-cheeked, bony stranger. But that unmistakable Irish gleam in her eyes ignited as she saw me, and all doubt vanished from my mind. She'd always been so passionate about her Irishness. Brenda, wow, I'm so glad you could make it. She ushered me into a large living room with a burning fireplace. I was so glad to get in from the biting wind. A large mirror directly across the door played tricks with the crackling flames. In front of the antique mirror was a big mahogany table with four large chairs. I could see into a narrow, darkened hallway to my left, which probably led into the bedrooms and the kitchen. I looked again at my old friend as she put my coat away. Her blonde hair was unkept, and there was a frantic look in her eyes. She took my arm and called out into the hall for Cheryl. A thin, dark-haired woman emerged from the shadowed hallway. Cheryl Garrett. She wore an apron about her waist, and her hair was no longer than she'd worn it years ago in Newark. She smiled weakly, wiped her hands on the apron, and shook my hand. Hello, Brenda. Dana and I are so sorry about what happened to Tina. She paused and shook her head. Dana tried to find out an address or phone number to call. We really wanted to call or send something for the services, but we couldn't find an address or anything in time, Dana said. I didn't know what to say. I never mastered the art of grief. I had just run away into myself. There were a few seconds of uncomfortable silence. Well, if you don't mind, Cheryl said, I have to finish dinner. She turned shyly and dissolved again into the hall. Dana motioned to the red vinyl couch behind me. It was one of those popular 1950s reproductions. She pulled up one of the chairs and sat across from me, took out some cigarettes, and asked if I cared for one. I think your memory is short, Dana. I never smoked, and I thought you gave that up back then. She shrugged and lit one with jittery hands. These are the only things that calm me. Dana, what's going on here? Your letter worried me. You mentioned the paranormal. That's why I wrote you, Brenda. You were our last hope. I'd heard that you were somewhat a psychic, and I Googled you on the computer. There were a couple of mentions in regard to some paranormal organization or of anxiety. You've got to save us, Brenda. There's some freaky shit going on in this house. I think something is trying to possess me. To be honest, I was shocked and stunned by her revelation. It was true that I had become learned in the occult and paranormal phenomena, and that because of my near-death experience, I had come back with unique powers that I was still trying to control. But how could I help Dana? I had to believe what she was telling me, because if it had been anyone but Dana who had confided this to me, I might have been more cautious. Dana had never been a believer or advocate of the paranormal. She was just like me back then. I urged her to explain the situation. At that moment, Cheryl came from the hall with plates and silverware and began setting the table. Dana called her over and continued when Cheryl was very firmly beside her. I gather you saw the oak tree on our lawn. How could I forget the giant looming tree? I nodded. Well, there was something up in that tree just two weeks ago. After Cheryl and I moved in, we decided we didn't care for the massive thing and agreed to have it removed. But about a week ago, while I mowed the lawn, I happened to glance up and notice a large brown paper bag attached to one of the big limbs. 
the bag seemed to contain something that I wasn't sure until I could take it down. It struck me at first as just a wind-blown bag somehow caught in the tree, but when I walked over and took a closer look, I saw that the bag was neatly tied to the tree by a twisted clothes hanger. I didn't think anything of it, and we both forgot about it. She paused, grabbed Cheryl even tighter, snuffed out the cigarette, and continued. Well, the week after that, on a windy day like today, I went out for the mail and noticed the bag on the lawn near our steps. I took the bag, and I turned out to be right, because tied around the clothes bag was a rusted, twisted clothes hanger. Not wanting to leave it on the lawn, I brought it inside. Cheryl had just opened, had just finished polishing the table, so I put it there. I was curious as hell, of course, and wanted to open it. Even though Cheryl objected, I untied the hanger and, to both our surprise, found an empty bag. I remember kidding Cheryl about her superstitions that day. I threw the bag and the hanger away. Dana stopped, and both were looking at me, waiting for feedback to the story. But I was still confused. Dana, have I missed something? What does this bag have to do with your paranormal hauntings? Cheryl's frightened voice echoed strangely through the house. Tell her, Dana, for Pete's sakes, tell her everything already. Tell her before night comes. Her hand was grasping Dana's shoulder tightly, her knuckles white from the pressure. Dana drew her clothes and kissed her gently. She looked back at me and saw the fear, and I saw the fear in her eyes. Brenda, with your knowledge of the paranormal and stuff like that, have you come across something like poltergeist? Should I joke about the movie? I decided not. They were genuinely frightened, and I needed to find out what was spooking them. I've never encountered what I would classify as a poltergeist, I said. What makes you so sure that what you have here in your house is a poltergeist? The shadows grew long outside and probed their way into the living room. Dana glanced nervously out the window behind me. Listen, I have to tell you before night comes, that bag, that damn bag I brought inside from the tree was not empty. I know this sounds crazy, but I think I let some kind of evil spirit loose. I swear it's tried to take my body more than once. In fact, I even tried to kill Cheryl one night. I shivered. Poltergeist didn't possess people. Have you had any other incidents in addition to what you just told me? Yes, she answered quickly. There have been times when our bed starts shaking violently for no apparent reason, and other times the doors around the house begin to bend as if some force were pushing against them, trying to break through. She paused, ran a hand through her hair, and stared directly into my eyes. You've got to help me. I didn't know what else to do but write for your help. Dana's story was unnerving. Why had she waited so long? From what she just told me, it sounded like something was definitely going on in her home. Despite the dense atmosphere, we managed to eat a nice meal of broiled fish, potatoes, broccoli, and apple pie that Cheryl had prepared. Dana had a small TV, but we opted to catch up on everything that had both devastated and elevated our lives. Although Dana tried hard to cover her jumpiness with recollections, her hands portrayed her condition. She couldn't keep them still. I found myself listening to every little sound and watching every shadow that didn't seem right. I'd grown very used to shadows in my life. Malfour House was full of them. Without us realizing how quickly time had passed, the clock, striking 12, took us off guard. Dana stood up, and Cheryl instantly went to her side. Something was wrong. The malevolence seeped deep into my system. The silence that overtook the house was unnatural. Nothing stirred outside. Dana, I asked softly, is it always like this? The silence, I mean? She looked at me and nodded, fear making her eyes wide. A cold chill suddenly invaded the house. It must have dropped at least 10 degrees. The darkness outside mocked us. I walked to Dana's side, scanning the room in dark hall. All I could make out were forms of flitting shadows. Despite all the signs of a definite presence, nothing much else happened. We all agreed to get to bed for the night. I went to bed almost regretting that I hadn't gotten a chance to see or experience something tangible. I couldn't get so much sleep as I lay in the small moonlit guest room. I always had trouble in places other than home. 
Hotel stays or staying with friends always meant sleepless nights. Dana and Cheryl must have fallen asleep because I couldn't hear any sound coming from the room next to mine. It was well past three in the morning when the little sleep I did manage to get was suddenly shattered by violent madness on my door. I shot up in bed, my heart thumping hard. I squinted my eyes in the dark, looking at the door. What I saw went beyond all the laws of nature and space. My door was actually curving inward from the force, of, from the force upon it on the other side. I wanted to get up and reach for it, but by the time I got up, put my slippers on and got to the door, the manifestation abruptly ceased, and Dana and Cheryl came rushing into my room. Are you all right, Brenda? Dana asked, scanning the room. She came and took my arm softly. I told her I was fine. It happens like this every night. If it isn't the bed shaking violently, it's the doors blowing off their hinges. Since no one was going to get back to bed, Cheryl offered to make us some coffee or tea. We all opted for coffee. After draining our mugs and talking about what had happened, I assured them I would be fine the rest of the morning, which thankfully did pass with no further incidents. I was glad of that because, frankly, I had no idea what I had on my hands here. I had come to the aid of an old friend, not knowing what to expect. I hope to gather more evidence today. The harrowing experience of the past night had left me perplexed and with too many missing pieces. Some of the things happening here had some indications of documented poltergeist cases, but possession and the other events I experienced did not. I still had not seen any indications of something or someone taking over Dana's body as she had claimed. Sitting in the living room table over breakfast with Dana and Cheryl, I discussed some of my thoughts. Well, we don't want to know what you can't do about it, Cheryl said in a bitter tone. You've been here one day. You've seen and felt everything we experience nearly every night. She nervously bit off a piece of toast. I don't give a damn about your speculations. We want to get rid of it. Let Brenda talk, Dana said sharply. It's true that some of the things have happened in front of Brenda, but I know she can help us. She looked at me with pleading eyes. What was this miracle that she expected me to perform? What has she heard about my cases? I was feeling frustrated. I did have one idea. I had only been involved in one seance with Susan Christie at Malfour House. I felt now might be a good time to try another one on my own. I looked from Dana to Cheryl. If you both agree, I'll attempt the seance tonight to find some answers. I feel I have to warn you, however, that I've only taken part in one other seance and have not attempted one of my own. I may not remember all the incantations or proper invocations, but I'm willing to give it a shot. Dana didn't even look at Cheryl beside her for consent. There was a deep sadness in her eyes. If it's the only thing that might save us now, how can we refuse? We set the time for midnight, and the time came only too quickly as the clock marked 11.50. A few hours before, I began to notice a drastic change in Dana's behavior. She appeared rude and antagonistic, almost hostile. Cheryl and I were setting the table for the seance when Dana came from the bedroom and stood before us. I stared unbelieving at her face. She was wild-eyed and breathing heavily. There'll be no seance here tonight or any other night for that matter, she screamed in anger. I saw her maniac maniacal graze fix on me. I recognized the state to be primary possession. Blue fire seemed to spit out from her eyes at me. You, she pointed a finger at me, are no longer needed. I will ask you to leave tonight. Cheryl's pleading lost gaze locked on me for an answer. Suddenly, Dana lunged at me, but I sidestepped her and she staggered back, almost falling if Cheryl and I had not supported her. As quickly as the possession happened, it was over. Dana was completely out of it. She slumped in our grasp, and we helped her into one of the chairs. She looked up at me, groggy and confused. I smiled and said we should proceed with the seance. I asked Cheryl to bring me three white candles to supply the light. I placed these on the center of the table, facing the mirror where we sat. With a slight shiver, I asked Dana and Cheryl to join hands. 
I began my summons. I am the holder of the knowledge to send you back to your place. I now invoke the seven seals of Solomon and the mighty commands they bring. I call thee thrice by the three unutterable names, spirit whose presence we have felt, to appear before us now. Almost immediately I felt a dark alien presence grip the house. Cold air suddenly rushed through the room, tilting lamps and lifting objects into the air. I knew I had to continue the summons. Nothing like this had happened at the seance at Malfour House. Spirit whose force we are now feeling, I command thee by the powers of the seven seals to show us your form so that we may know you. The wind stopped and the candles on the table sputtered and went out. We were now in the hands of the powers of darkness. For some reason, my eyes were attracted to the large mirror before us on the wall. I saw Dana and Cheryl do likewise. It suddenly began to fog and cloud up. Cheryl tried to break the circle, but Dana, now fully herself, held her hand firmly. Before our startled eyes, the fog in the mirror slowly seeped away, only to reveal not our images, but something so incredible that I gasped. What moments ago had been an everyday, ordinary antique mirror became a window to another world of grotesque shapes and colors, an alien and demonic landscape. Black, irregular mountains were visible in, this, in the distance, piercing a sickly orange sky. Rocks, which seemed more like blackened skulls, looked up in anguish from the discolored sand. Was this some vision of hell or another dimension? I barely noticed that to my right, Cheryl had fainted. With my limited but learned knowledge of the supernatural and paranormal, even I could not give a sane explanation to what lay before us. I had never seen or heard about anything like it before. The landscape had been desolate until in the distance, from the Black Mountains, a figure became distinctly visible. Dana jumped in her chair when she saw it approaching. I held her hand in a firmer grip. The world we were viewing was so vile that it had to be the domain of demons. Then the horror of that figure walking toward us in the mirror became more clear. It now stood facing us, standing between two leering rocks. It was human in the sense that it was shaped like a human. It wore a long black robe, but that was the lesser horror. The creature that stood before us had no skin or hair, and its eyeless sockets of black infinity bored deep into us through the mirror. It suddenly extended its arms toward us as if it were asking for something. Long skeletal fingers begged and pleaded. For what? I didn't know and didn't even want to guess. Without warning, the landscape suddenly began to change. The black shapes that haunted its borders multiplied and covered the entire scene. The creature had disappeared and the mirror began to cloud over again. Our view into the hellish world was closed and we saw only our frightened and pale reflections instead. By the time Dana came back with smelling salts for Cheryl, the mirror had returned completely back to normal. Cheryl screamed as she opened her eyes. It's okay, honey, it's all over with. Dana tried to hold her, but Cheryl was frightened. She left her and walked to the antique mirror. Get rid of it, Dana, she said, her voice quivering. I won't stay here another minute in this house with that horrible thing. Dana was finally able to calm her down and get her to bed. The both of us followed shortly after, and I was thankful nothing happened through the night. Dana and Cheryl may not be prepared for what I had to tell them in the morning. We had only a light breakfast of cereal. Both Dana and Cheryl wanted answers, and I attempted to explain what I thought. And I wasn't even sure that I sounded convincing to them because I sure as hell wasn't convinced of anything myself. Without someone like Mark Denby or Susan Christie to consult with, I was going on what I had researched and learned. Cheryl was still frightened, and Dana was silent and haggard. I want to make sure you both realize that I'm not an expert in this. I can't explain what happened to me after my near-death experience or what I'm supposed to do with the abilities I've been gifted with, but I'm going to give you my best guess. I paused and eyed them both. I believe what happened here last night was a very rare view into another world, perhaps another dimension. 
or maybe a view into hell itself. I can't positively say for sure. I paused and heard my voice trail off. It was Dana who responded. Brenda, that creature, the way it just stared at me. It stared and begged at me like it wanted something I had. What makes you think it was asking you for something? I asked, remembering quite clearly that it actually appeared to be focused on Dana. You two and your code logic, Cheryl's anguished voice cut the air. Can't any of you understand how simple it is? That place in the mirror is an evil place. I can feel it even now, the empty sky, the black mountains, those rocks that were faces. She stopped and hugged herself with a shiver. It's a vision of hell, that's what we saw, a vision of hell. She got up and ran to the hall and into the bedroom. Dana looked hopelessly lost as she got up with a frown and followed her. I stood before the small windows in the living room, trying to figure out what it was about this place that bothered me. I could sense, even during this bright day, that something waited here. But what? Dana came up behind me, breaking me free of my dark thoughts. She sighed. It's no use, Brenda. I can't reason with her. I felt now was a good time to let Dana know what I thought was happening here and how she might deal with it. Dana, I want you to listen to me and understand. I have to strongly suggest that you find a priest to do an exorcism in your house. In my opinion, what you have in your house is not a poltergeist. This is something far more dangerous. I believe it to be a demonic force that has somehow gained a foothold in your home. Demons often possess human beings. The disturbances will not stop and can become deadly, Dana, especially since it seems to come after you. I can't help you any further. I don't know my way around demons and demonology. I feel it is a path for someone of the clergy. I'd be happy to stay and offer any assistance if you'd like me to. Dana smiled weakly. I just want to thank you, Brenda, for dropping everything and coming out here to the middle of nowhere to help us. You've been a big help, really. She shuffled her feet, looking down then back at me. You know, I don't deal too well with death, and I just wanted to tell you how really sorry and devastated I was over Tina's death. We had good times. I wondered if that was why I dropped everything in my life to come out here to Millport in response to a letter from someone who, while a friend at one time, had disappeared from my life for years. Was it to cling to the past with Tina in it? Did I hope to find a glimmer of that happy space in New York with Tina? Dana broke my reverie by placing a hand on my arm. I gotta go check on Cheryl, okay? We're gonna talk over what you told me and go from there. She walked away and disappeared into the hallway to try and calm down Cheryl. It was on that fateful day that events changed and led to the madness that befell us all. It was afternoon and the wind outside had spent all morning working itself into a frenzy. The swirling gusts pounded steadily on the doors and windows, howling through the giant oak outside. Cheryl had calmed down considerably, but the rushing wind said nothing to ease her tension. The clock in the living room had just struck six, and I was in the guest room packing my clothes, when a scream from the kitchen set me running there. Cheryl had dropped a plate on the floor and stood with her hands over her mouth, eyes dilated with fear. Dana stood a few feet from her, a large butcher knife in her hand. I had to remain calm and keep the situation from spiraling out of my control. Dana knew I was there. She whirled to face me. When I saw her face, her eyes, I knew there was now no hope for her. Her eyes had become burning demonic fires. I tried to speak to her, my words strong, but calm. Dana, please listen to me. Can you see me, Dana? Can you hear me? I'm Brenda, your friend, remember? Listen to me. Focus on me, Dana. Fight it. It can't take you if you fight it. I couldn't stop her. I didn't move fast enough. She lunged at Cheryl and buried the glistening knife into her stomach. Blood burst everywhere. She slumped to the floor, a puddle of blood smearing the tile. I knew now that the demon in the mirror would not allow Dana to get away. I started to back away slowly, while Dana still towered over Cheryl. 
I would have gone to the door straight to my SUV, but as I ran into the living room toward escape, I looked at the mirror. It was fogging over again, and I suddenly found myself paralyzed. I could not move my legs. I tried desperately, but it was as if I were chained to the floor where I stood. I looked again at the mirror. The orange sky, black mountains, and scarred skulls leered back at me. I saw the strange black shadows that had blocked our vision earlier appear and swim and dance before me, performing some hellish dance of death. Nowhere could I see that horrifying creature that had appeared before us. Then from the kitchen, I heard shuffling. I pulled once again to my feet with all my might. They were still bound by some unfierce, unseen force. Dana was coming after me, I thought. I suddenly experienced a deep fear. Grandmother, I called to her quietly. Darkness had fallen, and only the flicker of the fireplace shed light on that horrible scene. Something came out of that hall from the kitchen, but it wasn't Dana McCleary. I suddenly felt nauseated and lightheaded. The stench gagged in my throat. The creature from the mirror stood there in the hallway. The white skull glistened in the firelight. It brought out a bony hand from within the black robe and raised it out to me, beckoning. I pulled once more on my feet and suddenly found I could move. I edged back away from the demonic figure and felt the door behind me. That's when the demon began to move towards me, his hand still outstretched. No, I yelled out. Go back to where you came from. Suddenly, a pale, rose-colored energy field enveloped me, and I instantly knew the power of the rose stone. My grandmother's gift of healing was keeping me from harm. The thing stopped, its skeletal hand only a few inches from my face. A stench of things long dead stung my nostrils. I moved away from it towards the couch. It didn't follow me. I was protected. I looked deep into those empty sockets of black anguish, thinking to look death in the eye, only to see instead the caramel eyes of Dana McCleary. What madness made such a thing possible? It couldn't possibly be Dana. In my startled state, I was not aware of what really happened then. I remember vaguely the moments of the movements of the creature. The door flung open, and the lumbering, vile smelling thing was gone. If this demon found his way to the outside world, I shuddered to think who it would torture next. The mirror, when I looked at it, was clear once more, making the entire tragedy seem unbelievable. But the gruesome facts remained. As soon as I collected my nerves, I telephoned for 911. When I went back into the kitchen, I found Cheryl's stabbed body and Dana laying next to her, rolled up into a tight ball and babbling incoherently. Cheryl was dead. I could do nothing for her. But I went to their bedroom, grabbed a blanket, and wrapped around Dana, reassuring her that help was coming. It seemed like a forever before I heard the sound of a siren approaching the house. The paramedics had arrived first and began to take care of poor Dana immediately, since Cheryl was now the jurisdiction of the medical examiner. Dana was totally non-responsive as I watched them take her away in the stretcher. The police arrived shortly thereafter. I answered all the questions they needed to ask, although they now have my business card and reasons to possibly come knocking on my door with more questions. I left Millport, Dana, and McCleary's house with a heavy heart and disturbed thoughts, but I only wanted to get back home, back to Malfour, Cubby, and butterscotch. It wasn't until days later, sitting comfortably in my study at Malfour House, entering these notes to my open cases files in my Mac laptop, that I came to an uneasy and unsubstantiated conclusion as to what happened in that godforsaken house. That bag, that brown paper bag that Dana had found in the oak tree, somehow contained the soul of that foul thing in the mirror. I don't know how or why, perhaps by some occult ritual of black magic. It had been imprisoned there. When Dana opened the bag, the demonic life force was embedded in her body. That was why the demon begged from the mirror. It was asking for its soul. And when it came forth from that mirror to reclaim its life essence, it found it had to remove it from Dana's body. And in so doing that night, took Dana's soul as well. 
carrying it into his own unimaginable hell. You see, Dana didn't die, not in the conventional manner. She's in a mental state hospital in Portland. I'm able to speak, hear, or move. She was alive, yet horribly dead. A human vegetable, a body living in eternal darkness. End of file. <laughs> wow. Spooky, spooky. Did you hear the thunder? I did not. <laughs> I'm sorry, I did not. It's going to work, right? Do you know what? Like there was, you know, I know that you're probably into the reading and I was listening and I don't even, like I'll have to listen to the recording, but there was thunder rolling and, and whatnot uh, during your uh, reading. So it'd be interesting if the mic actually picked it up. Oh, my God, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be wonderful? So it would. It would be glorious. <laughs> Because it got loud at a certain point, and I was like, I wonder if the mic is picking that up. So yeah, we'll, that'll be our own little mystery when we listen to it again. That's wonderful and marvelous. <laughs> well, even if it doesn't come on the recording, let me just tell you, folks, there was thunder rolling in the streets as she was telling the story. Oh, uh, good. Yes, that is certainly not a happy ending. Whew. No, not a, not a happy ending. <laughs> You know what? Good for you, because there's so many times that, um, you know, in real life, there aren't always, you know, happy, shiny endings to things. No, of course. But I think, though, uh, Liz, I think, well, a portion of our culture does, they, they, they want that happy ending. They need it, and they really don't want to expose themselves to something that, you know, it's not going to offer them that. But, um you know, there are those that, that do like that, that do do like to get the, you know, the little scares and the thrills and, um, you know, and after all, it is a Brenda Strange story and Brenda will happily return to, <laughs> to more cases and such, but um, um, our little um, Cheryl and, uh, and Dana just were not so lucky. <laughs> well, I like the, the, the world that you created uh, through the mirror. I did. I'm a very big H.P. I mean, I, you know, my diet of, you know, Edgar Allan Poe and H.P. Lovecraft and all of those um, um, supernatural slash fantasy slash science fiction writers. Um, and uh, um, it was it was something that really, you know, it was horror, you know, all the all the all the, you know, trappings of a horror. But it can also be, you know, another dimension as well. So and I know H.P. Lovecraft played around with a lot of um different dimensions and space and all these, you know, things that he invented, which is, you know, marvelous worlds. So, um, I thought I'd play with that. It's a little bit left crash and I, I like that. So also I like, I like that there actually was a resolution of sorts. He was pleading for something that they didn't know for right. which they were pleading and that in order to get back what he needed, uh, he had to take it and, and incidentally took the soul of another as well. Right, right. Which is, you know, there's, there's the introduction and there's the pleading and then there's the resolution. And unfortunately, right. his happy ending is not a happy ending for the other characters. No. Um, and, I, and I wrote this in purposely in um, the type of language that was common in, in, in Lovecraft's uh, stories, which, mm -hmm. uh, which of course is a far cry from the language of today's fiction and things, mm -hmm. you know, but I wanted to have that little flair and again, it would, you know, it might not appeal to everyone, but it's what I wanted to capture and, I, and, and, and so, you know, I wrote it that way and um, kind of using some of that. Well, you know, one of the reasons why I started this uh, series, The Bedtime Stories, is because, well, I love, I love reading. I get most of my um, entertainment from reading, much more so than TV. I mean, I love to watch TV, but it doesn't really reach me in the same way. And I feel that reading, um, doing a reading out loud, telling a story, a bedtime story, this time a spooky one, um, it's a really important art, you know, the oral tradition, the storytelling. Oh, absolutely. Um, 
I was a reader way before I was a writer, although, uh, yeah, I, I mean, my reading was my, it still is. It's, you're right. I agree with everything you said. Um, there is so much, you know, there's so much that, to me, um, television and film is not interactive with reading. The reader isn't just reading. Um, we're actually using our imagination and we're being transported and we're like, you know, right there mm -hmm. doing things. But with the visual, you're not. Or television is a visual. So um, reading is, is, to me, premier entertainment. I wish some more people would see it that way <laughs> because, you know, um, film and video and everything really, you know, is direct competition to, to reading and books. But um, uh, maybe, maybe someday. There's, there, you know, and, and the funny thing is I'm dyslexic and I had a very hard time learning how to read and write. And now it, it's ironically my favorite form of entertainment. And the reason being is that it truly engages all of my brain. And I, I love movies and, and, and whatnot. But I oh, found I in my, in like not my old age, but you know, I'm, I'm 36 and I find that I don't have a lot of patience to listen to a new, watch a new series or watch a new movie half the time. But I oh, always... You know, Dad, I, I, you're right. I find the same thing. It's like, I do have friends who get very ex very excited about new series. Hey, check out this television. It's coming up on NBC or CBS or whatever. And I think, oh, that sounds good. But then I just, I cannot get into it. You know, back when I was younger, you know, back in the, those days, and <laughs> I'm 62 now, but... Um, Back in those days, I was able to follow television series, and now I can't. I'd rather, like, go pick up a book. I really can't get into, you know, television anymore and series and things. So, you know, I can, I can see your, your it's point It's so there. strange because you would think it would take more effort to get into a book. And, but for me, I mean, you know, when, when the writing is right, it just sucks you in and, and you don't... Absolutely. Yeah, you don't have to wait for it to, to tug you in in the way that you're watching something. And, and you know, it's almost like, okay, it, you can tell me a great movie and maybe I'll watch it. But for me to, like, climb into a book and use my imagination and and just go wherever I need to go in, in that story. And it's so funny because sometimes I'm so interacting with a book that I'll change details. <laughs> I'll change details to my to my to my brain. Like there's this book called Chance, um, but it's a by Grace Lennox. But it's also Jennifer Fulton, and um, she has Rose Beecham as another uh, pen yes, name. Yes, you yes. know what I'm talking about. And so yes, there's I this do. there's this character, and it's described as a Lolita like character with you know, um, a short bob and, and, you know, I think beautiful blue eyes. But in my brain, I turned the seductress into this beautiful, almost Mediterranean, long brown hair, golden skin, one knot. Because to me, that was the most, like, the, the jo one of the jokes about her was, like, she likes to tease the animals because she's so alluring and sexy and, and and difficult to turn away from. And so I just turned her into this like really sexy, exotic thing rather than, you know, um, a childlike looking person who, who, you know, is, is an adult. Right. And, and you know, that's, see, that's, that's what a book can afford you. Uh, a movie, no, you're there. The character is, is thrown in your lap and, and it throw, and it's in your brain, just the image is right there and you're stuck with it. That's it the way they present it to you. In a book, you know, you can do exactly what you just described. You can, like, you know, you know, go in your own mind and create your own visuals. That's, that's what a good book will do. It's wonderful. It stretches your imagination and your brain. Yeah, it's a, it's a good thing. Cells, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really good thing. And, you know, I... I so I, I, I don't know if what I do is exactly promoting literacy, even though it is, um, because I like to read books and I encourage other people to read the things that I've read. Um, but it's just a wonderful world to experience uh, and to, to leave the trappings of things that are already ready-made for us. And, um, Absolutely. Yeah, so I really love it. it. It's it's one of my joys. I've had, I have recorded about 
13 episodes, um, but right now the, the next one coming up is on Wednesday, and that's uh, Lacey Gardner is doing a really great story. Um, her story was kind of born from a reading she had gone to where women were asking uh, for stories about them, you know, women who are over 50. Right, yes. And so she had created uh, a story with uh, two characters in their 80s who had been together Uh for a very long time. And the one character was saying in the beginning that, you know, up until last year, we were still having relations. And it was, a you know, I always thought of it as a sign of my virility. And I was like, you get to have a bad self. (laughs) You get to have your bad self. You go, girlfriend. You show us. You show us little whippersnappers what we're supposed to be talking about. I think shows like yours and some of the other, I think it's wonderful for the community. And your your, um, bedtime stories are just marvelous because you're, you're, you're reaching out and trying to, to know, to, to expose different storytelling, I mean, stories and storytellers and, and all kinds of things, which is great because uh, people will, will, you know, have whatever they would like to listen, have a nice little sampling. And, you know, with the authors reading it, they're, they're, they're you know, that's, that's all a really good treat. And, and I think the, I think your show and like, like I said, some of these other shows are really a, a real asset to the community. And, and, um, that's why I think a lot of readers and authors and readers and everyone uh, supports them, I think. And I, yeah, I, I think love it. And it, you know, it reminds me of, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. It, uh, it reminds me, I think it's a Nina Simone song and she's saying, I'm waiting for you to turn me on. Like, you know, and not in just the, the arousal sense, but to, yeah, right, to right. light somebody up again. And right. I'd like to turn on my listeners to being interested in um, oral history, oral story, story, bleh, storytelling, <laughs> and get into it and, and experience new authors and be like, huh, that was really fun or very interesting or different or engaging or... Yes. And, and, and oral, oral storytelling, got, I mean, it's, it's how everything got started as far as stories. I mean... Um, when I was little, we were like a, a pack. I mean, back in the 50s, 60s, um, you know, kids were able to run around <laughs> in the yards and through the streets with any fears. And uh, we, my cousins lived near us, and we were all together. And my grandmother on my mom's side um, was the storyteller of the family. And fortunately for me, I say fortunately because I love the dark stories, my grandmother only told us ghost stories. And she'd call us all together and she, you know, we'd sit around the kids and she'd tell us the ghost stories. And they were wonderful. And that's where, you know, that's where part of my fascination for things, you know, supernatural and things of that type and ghosts and stuff uh, came from. So, but, you know, without those, who knows if I might have been fluous. But I think, I think that oral storytelling is where, where, where we all began as far as, you know telling stories absolutely and my my um my father but especially my father's brother eddie he could tell the most fantastic story and and you would you would swear it was real you know it's the irish you know the gift of gab yes yes yes. (laughs) my my uncle eddie i think think there's a born storyteller in every family and you know, if we're fortunate enough to be able to sit and, and be enriched by their stories and everything, and and I think you know, again, I think not all not all the kids that used to hang around and listen to the stories probably were, you know went on to write or enjoy reading or anything of those stories. But I'm glad I did, mm-hmm. and so um, I was very happy that my grandmother was the uh, like the storyteller and that she loved ghost stories and she'd share them with us. <laughs> what a wonderful detail. I just learned just by this little conversation about that, about your grandmother telling you ghost stories and now you write really wonderful gothic dark tales and, and paranormal <laughs> stories. And, and, and you're still, in my brain, you're still that little kid listening to your grandma tell you stories. Now you're the person telling the stories, but it still has that childlike wonder of of the story of fiction of of make-believe 
thank you. I'm enjoying them. I've enjoyed them for a long time, writing them, and of course, keeping up with the literature since I was growing up, I kept up with it. So I give her thanks all the time, you know, <laughs> when I write these things. So uh, thanks. Thanks, Grandmama. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Grandma, too, because you, yeah. you gave us a very nice storyteller. Thank you so much, Patty, for coming on the show. No, oh, I'm always happy to do it. And thank you for the invite to the story. I mean, we mentioned it when we, we last spoke, when we uh, did our conversation before. And glad I was able to do it tonight. Yes, absolutely wonderful. Thank you so With much, the Patty. thunder and everything. Yes. yes, there was thunder. And I'm sure if I was outside, I would have seen some lightning during it. And it was just so apropos. Oh, my goodness. So take care, Patty. Yes, you too. Okay. Bye. Good night. Bye-bye.